Good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to introducing test flowcharts, a free no-code test automation platform by Narayan Raman. Narayan is the CEO of uh, Sahi Pro, Taito Software Private Limited. He's the author of uh, Sahi, which is an open source test automation tool equivalent to Selenium. He has commercialized it as uh, Sahi Pro. He has been working in test automation solution for the last 15 years. Recently, he has launched the product test flowchart. Without any further delay, over to you, Narayan. Thank you, Pankaj, for the introduction. Thank you much. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Narayan. And um, today I'm going to be presenting about test flowcharts. Um, it's a flowchart driven intelligent test automation platform. Um, so before this, uh, we had, uh, so I'm the author of Sahi, the open source tool, and uh, we built a Sahi Pro as the you know, a commercial version of it. And we've been working in the automation space for a long, long time now. And um, recently we have started looking at like, um, based on how we have been progressing in the, um, in in our own improvements in the to in the Sahi Pro tool, uh, we we found ourselves inching closer and closer towards a no code uh, test automation tool. So uh, test flow charts is an attempt at that. And um, today I'm going to talk about and introduce like test flow charts to everyone. So um, so what are the problems with the existing solutions out there? And what is the problem uh, that we are trying to solve here? Uh, so initially, like you know, test automation tools started off with uh, pure recorded playback tools. Um, these eventually reached their limitation because like it was too simplistic for for real world usage uh, then selenium like uh, test automation engines even sahi like test automation engines um, they they were uh, they came in um, and uh, especially with selenium and like these uh, these tools they were very code centric um, uh, it was too low level and code inten intensive and um, because they professed a, a, um, a way of doing automation where you don't use recorders, etc. Um, there was a lot of drudgery. You would do the same thing again and again. Um, and uh, being caught in the in that world where, like you, you know, you're you're uh, I didn't you're working with locators. You're trying to add weights. You're trying to do you know um, uh, interactions with the user interface. It, you, it is very easy to lose the focus of a business. So then, like, of course, there were these other uh, layers that came on top of that, um, DSLs, domain-specific languages, then uh, BDD, behavior-driven development, and then tools like Cucumber. So these actually um, were, were nice because they, were a, they gave a better business abstraction, uh, and it was easy to relate to what is happening in the business. Um, but they also had limitations. Uh, first thing, even though it was it was looking like English, it had some structure around it, and that was not always very natural for the business user. So the implementer, the end implementer, uh, was not really the business user, even though it was purported to be. Uh, tools like these also needed a good amount of plumbing code. Uh, we needed to implement all the um, uh, the keywords or like whatever they are called, um, and uh, this needed programming knowledge and like the ability to actually pass in parameters, etc. And, um, and they were also implemented using tools like Selenium underneath, uh, which combined with the structured, you know, approach of uh, BDD and these uh, other tools, um, it, it, it could become, you know, actually more complex to actually work on these than um, simpler. So, of course, like, you know, um, different people have different experiences with these, but broadly, like, you know, these are some things that uh, people face. Um, even with like Sahi Pro itself, like our journey has been such that, you know, uh, um, this started us as Sahi, the open source tool in 2005. Um, we had record and playback right from the start along with like, you know, um, it had the most things that would, that um, we needed to actually run it with continuous integration, et cetera. But having said that, right, it did start off as a, as a record and playback tool, but um, the scripted, the recording, recording was exposed as scripts because we understood that, you know, people would need to refactor it and, you know, structure it in such a way that it is understandable. Um, it fixed the drudgery of, you know, um, of uh, man, uh, manually handcrafting those um, interactions. Um, and it also like, you know, with the, with the recorder, it, it speeded up the um, element identification, et cetera. Um, but at that point of time, it was still not like very close to the business. So then we introduced scenario files, um, which actually like where, uh, where Excel like user interface from which you could, uh, you know, you could uh, write your, business scenarios and then it, you know you would basically record record uh, your interactions then extract out uh, functions or keywords and then you would call them from these scenario files that is the next step that we took so that brought in an ability to actually 
in I know, express the business, but then be able to use the keywords that were there already. This is similar to BDD and other like robot framework and other things that are there in the, in the system. Then we came out with a business driven test automation framework, wherein we actually said, okay, you know what, don't drive it by recording and then extracting out the functions, rather proceed the other way around, because we needed to be able to express the business before the application was built, because we wanted to try to see if their in, in sprint automation could be done. And there, what we did was we actually allowed the, um, the scenarios to be written first in the Excel like interface, along with data and like, you know, um, uh, what that data represented, et cetera. And then from there, like, you know, drive the, so when, when it would see that a, a particular, like, you know, uh, keyword is not implemented, it would, it would, um, prompt you to actually either implement it or record your interactions with the system. And that br brought you to actually, you know, um, a fairly business driven test automation process where the keywords were not written a prior. You would actually like write your business scenario and then like from there, go to, um, go to the actual implementation. So this was this this um, so we have been uh, use the, this has been a part of our product for the past three years or more and it is it has been very well received by our customers um but we still found a few problems and like a few areas of improvement in this um one of them was that you know um if if let's say uh, there was a scenario wherein we were applying a coupon to a product or, or a shopping cart now there were scenarios where the coupon would be you know would have expired or not expired for these two things we would actually have to you know duplicate all those steps that were for um, you know uh, expired and then like you know put it for another and then tweak a few preconditions post conditions etc and then run it so basically for each condition that would creep in about you know whether a coupon is valid or not like it could be that okay um, it can be applied only once or it could be only applied if the overall uh, cart amount was greater than uh, this specific amount so for all these scenarios we would copy paste the whole thing again 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 and then like you know tweak those places where the actual changes needed to be made and then execute them so it quickly became a lot of like you know um, uh, copy paste and this was actually happening in the um, the excel like interface now of course like you know another way of doing this would have been to actually put this all into a data driven framework and put all this you know um, these uh, conditions etc inside the data driven framework and just pass the data from outside but then we lose visibility of like what is going on inside that framework or who like you know uh, are we taking the correct decisions is it actually like doing the right path given the right conditions etc so all that is lost so it has now become a black box to use to which you sub supply data and then everything is taken care of internally so that actually so you either had a chance of like you know too much duplication or you had had another implementation where like too much was being hidden so we wanted to strike a balance in this so that the actual so there was a lot of business value in figuring out like which condition caused it to apply the coupon or not apply the coupon so we wanted to bring that out so um that that was one of the things we wanted um then another thing we saw was um, we would write a scenario which says you know okay okay add a, add this product to the shopping cart and then like you know apply this coupon but who will set up that product that needs to be added to the shopping cart who will set up the coupon that needs to be added so like there were pre a prior steps before that which we needed to actually do so say that you know hey um, create a um, yeah, log in as an admin, create a product, and then create a coupon for that particular product, and then you apply that thing. So these preconditions were also like you know we needed to actually do that for every every one of them. And a lot of times the actual test case would be very small, the preconditions would be pretty big. So and that's a lot of implementation that we need to do to do all that. Now. Um, then another thing that we noticed was like data needed to be passed around and data was kind of loosely uh, coupled or like, you know, we should say it wasn't tightly integrated with the overall solution. Data was something separate and then we applied it on top of uh, the rest of the um, uh, these test cases. So we wanted to bridge all this and see if we could come up with something and what we actually like, we had been trying this for a while now and like what we came out with turned out to be fairly no code. So um, what I'm going to present here is like, is, is that the test flow charts thing. Um, so what are these test flow charts? They're a clear visual way of depicting intention of the application. Um, it's easily understandable by everyone and it is built for automation. So why test flow charts? It gives you high visibility. And of course, like all the reasons that I told you, it is easy to maintain. Um, the the actual implementation of automation is fairly uncomplicated and effortless so there is no coding required and because of all this it's quite scalable so in your team it is very easy to actually implement automation um, and uh, you know derive value out of it and so what are the different automation aspects that we cover um, in tesla charts 
um, we cover the UI interactions, of course, like you know, um, clicking set value and what all those things. So we um, we have extensive experience in the um, UI automation space um, because we built Sahipro and like you know, Sahipro interacts with uh, desktop, mobile, um, browsers. So, um, so we've been cross browser since 2005. So that's one of the earliest products out there, along with Selenium, which could actually do that. Um, so we, we we do those interactions very very well. Um, so that is that is available. Then in in test flow charts we have um, data generation which is inbuilt. Um, it has automatic form field validation which is inbuilt. Um, it has automatic precondition matching which means that you need to specify only the path you need to traverse along with in and well, along with specifying your precondition uh, preconditions in a specific way. And if you do that correctly, then it'll um, automatically um, try to figure out all the pre paths and then execute all of that. Um, Overall, in the user interface, we give designated places for all the UI elements, the data, the data generators, etc. So it is all uh, well structured. So anybody who is new to the system can easily, you know, like um, learn that and you know do a consistent job of it. It has inbuilt uh, reporting, um, which is in progress right now. So, uh, so it's testflowcharts.com is available publicly. Anybody can sign up. It's a there's a it's a freemium model, so the free version is available. Um, so in that, like the reporting is not yet there. And apart from that, um, one of the things about test automation is not just about executing it. What we want to derive out of it is uh, an understanding of how ready our product is to be shipped. And for that, we need to actually bring out, um, we need to be able to observe how, um, what is working and what is not working, whether what, like, you know, uh, are all our high priority workflows working correctly? What is the significance of the places of those parts which are not working correctly? So this actually helps us uh, you know, uh, take business decisions, uh, go, no, go, et cetera, off the, off the build that, you know, you want to ship. So these things can be easily pulled back and showed on the user interface itself, which is the, which is the flow chart like thing. Um, and because it is built on the Sahi platform, um, it can actually work with the browsers, desktop, and mobile. The current version, which is right now available um, uh, online, is is a um, is it supports only br uh, web browsers. So, um, given that as an introduction of like what test flow charts is and like what it does and why, what was the motivation behind it? Um, let me get into a demo of this. So this is what the test flow charts user interface looks like once you log in. Um, so I'm going to create a new project. And um, so this will, this creates, creates a project and I'm going to create a new flow chart. Okay. Um, so let's see what a flow chart looks like. Okay. So um, this is where we start from. What we do is right click and say, OK, so what are we trying to do here? Um, let's actually try to uh, register a user into a system. It's a fairly simplistic case that uh, most people understand. So we'll do that. So I'm going to say, I'm going to give this a label of register, register user. I'll also save this and this flowchart. And um, now we, we start writing some preconditions, some actions, and some post conditions or like, you know, uh, state changes. So for this, we do an add node and say, um, I want to specify a condition, which is actually user dot uh, exists is equal to false. So we want to start off with a user does not exist. Okay. Um, so let's do that. Then the next thing we want to do is um, let's say that like we want to arrive at a particular point here. So we will, we will do, um, we'll add an action node. Okay. We'll add a node and say action and we'll say, okay, we want to land up at the registration screen. So whatever path from path you come from, um, go and navigate to the registration screen. So these orange ones are actually actions. These double lined ones are, uh, are conditions. Okay. So, um, now what we do is we add a, um, I mean, now we add a, another action which says uh, user. So now here you see that you know the user has been specified as hash user, and even in the condition we we put it as hash user. So that's an entity in the system. Um, we add that we say register user, and then we'll add another node. So we'll say you know um, action uh, confirm registration, um, and uh, 
these things lead us to a post condition or an outcome which is which will say at this point user dot exists is equal to true and the outcome is also that like another outcome that we could do is uh, verify user registered okay okay so this seems to be a flow that we have created okay so let's save this now the, okay i would believe that this makes sense for uh, for any person who looks at this um it's it's fairly english like okay but of course there are these this these syntaxes um we believe like it can be easily learned okay now um what i did was i right clicked and said show paths okay so this shows us um the, the the different keywords that need to be implemented here so it says you know navigate from the base to registration register the user confirm the registration and verify that the user registered okay um now let's go ahead and um, implement this okay so i'm going to click on this it shows up the keyword dialog um and we're going to launch a browser here so i'll say open browser and you will see that a browser will open up now Okay, there, there is the browser. So we are going to do this test on an open cart application. This is an open source application, which, um, you know, it's an open, um, it's a shopping cart application. Now, how did that browser come up? So what happened was like, you know, um, we, we have this um, TFC engine running on this machine. Okay. And uh, how do you do that? You actually go to the, under the open browser run settings. Um, it allows you to download the TFC engine from here and start it. And once you start it, it will show you all the browsers that are there in the system. And you can specify the start URL here. And once you apply that from that point on, whenever you do open browser, it opens that browser in that particular URL. Of course, you can change the URL to whatever you want uh, so that it, you interact with your application. Um, so here we are, um, we have the application here. Now let's look at the first keyword, which is to say, which says that, you know, navigate from base screen to the registration screen. So this at registration and add base, it's our, our screens. Okay. Um, we'll, we'll start. So when we did hash user, that was an entity. Uh, when we do at uh, registration, that's a screen. Um, uh, we will talk about like why they are different or what they are. So let's start recording now. And uh, we want to navigate from base to registration. So we will just do that. We'll click here. It shows this register thing and we click on register. So we see that those two steps have been recorded. Okay. So we'll save this keyword. So we are at the registration thing. We'll go to the next step, which says register hash user. So it asked us to, it prompted us to save that, you know, create that entity. So we created that. Um, here we are at the register user thing. And in this, we're going to fill in values. Here, okay. So let me, um, again, like, you know, it's, it's still in recording. So we'll, we'll do, um, we'll fill in some, um, Some values here. So it says that your user account has been created and all the interactions that we did here um, have been recorded here. Okay. So we will again, like go to the next step and we'll save this keyword and then go to the next, next, uh, confirm registration screen, which is just this much. So, um, it, it may have been like, you know, um, you may have wondered why I actually did a use, you know, um, um, register user and then a confirm user that's because that had a form. And like, when we come to validations, we need to, uh, we kind of like, you know, utilize, you know, bank on the fact that, um, just the form related fields can be se kept separate from the rest of it. So, um, I'm not sure if I made sense, but we'll come back to that. So uh, this is the um, confirm registration here. And um, this is the logout. And at this point, like it just shows, you know, a logout screen. And that kind of means that you have registered. So what I would do is like, you know, um, I'll just verify in for the next one, which says verify your user registered. I'll do a lame thing of just like verifying that the logout link exists. Okay. So uh, for that, I could do something like this. Um, this is not an action that you're performing on the browser, but rather like something that you derive from it. So I'll click on add step and say assert, um, you know, exists. And, uh, here it says element, I'll inspect it. Okay, I'll inspect, uh, bring the inspector and then control hover on the logout. Um, it, it shows me what it is and I'll put it into this. And um, add this. so that's that's my assert exists of that link logout. Of course, like it could have been um, better and nicer, but like we'll, we'll uh, stop for now. So we'll save this also, okay. And um, 
let's close this and we will so you see that all of them look uh, black now so which means that they are they are uh, implemented um we can now run this but if you if you have ever done this kind of automation you would realize that uh, we just um, you know registered uh, dhoni at example.com and if we try to do it again it's going to fail okay um so for the interest of time i can say i can tell you that it will fail so what um, instead of that like what we are going to do is do something else slightly different so we'll go back to this keyword okay here we see that a lot of um, um, you know interactions have happened so here i want to you know separate out um this this first name last name email etc and store it into the entity of user and also store all these elements text box first name text box last name etc along with those uh, those entity attributes so so let me do quick extract okay so here um it shows me that okay these are all the things that i could extract i'm going to do um you know user dot uh, first name for that and user dot last name and this would be email i believe and then like phone right so we we did all that and these uh, separate things like we can actually put it so those elements have been associated with that particular entity itself because if you if you um if you have noticed like you know all user interface elements fall into two broad categories either elements that are uh, pertain like you know are bound to a, a data or they are unbound to the data so for example the um, the text box where you fill in the user's first name is bound to the first name like so nothing else can be put there so you always put the first name of the user and it gets bound to the you know in the database to the first name or wherever you are storing it so um these elements we keep it with the first name itself because it, you wouldn't use a password you wouldn't enter a username in the password field so it, it's all kept separately okay um and these uh, the, the the agree button etc that we will keep it as um, you know part of the registration screen okay so we have put that like that and then we do extract okay so when we do extract you see that this particular all the all these uh, steps look a little different now and they say you know hey set value but the param actually looks like this it shows that you know okay it is the first name input inside the user attribute and it is taking the value of uh, user dot first name now, now what does all this mean so let's actually look at this what did we extract what is it that we did right now okay so this is the we edit the user okay this is the entity user and in that entity we have we have created all these attributes first name last name email phone password etc okay and along with this we have actually stored the ui element into which it was populated so for example first name okay so it says first name input you can give more meaningful names to these but it's just like you know it it just auto generates these things because it thinks it you know that's all it can do um now uh, the next thing it also does is it actually associates valid data generators with it okay so um, what that means is during automation you want to like actually run the same script again and again the repeatability is a very you know uh, very major thing in in test automation and for that what we try to do is like you know um, associate uh, some you know some data generator for each each of these fields now you could actually say uh, um, you know give me this text along with some uh, random characters or like give me this number like of this size with you know with random numbers or you could say like pick from this list etc so there are these various data generators that are available that you can associate with it and for by default like we have just you know uh, put it as you know use whatever text you filled in and then add some like min length max length of uh, text here so that like whatever is filled in uh, in the in the form eventually will look like this and for email like uh, this is one of the techniques that you could use so for email like what we are doing is um, by default like we add a you know um, add a timestamp to it with a plus um, before the add so uh, most email clients actually ignore that part so you can actually just uh, you know create newer newer emails uh, using that but it will all land up in the same email address so for now like we have done it like this of course you could do other generators etc okay so um, that's what it does apart from this it you can also say okay what are the invalid uh, you know invalid data for a first name so for example like i could say that you know hey um uh, th there is a for a blank uh, value there is a problem okay or there was a, there is a limit in this saying greater than 32 characters so you know i could put in um i could put in a long value you know this is like you know text with more than 32 characters so we could add these validation related stuff also along with the first name so 
in the first name we are storing elements that are you know pertinent to first name we are storing an a data generator valid data generator along with it and we are also saying what are the invalid data that 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 uh, you know uh, that field validation should you know uh, fail um, so those things we are putting here of course um, for example for an email you could also do much more which is to say you know hey um, emails is a standard format so it's like it's part of the rfc so you can actually say okay give me all the suggestions for invalid data suggestions for email okay so this so it tells you, you know okay i have we have all these like you know um problems that you could have at is missing incomplete email id the domain is missing etc so you could take these suggestions you could pick what you want and then you say you know add it as as validations for that you could you could do it like that so i'm not going to do that because it will take a long you know it will be a lot of validations here okay so um so we we so that is what we did. We'll we'll save this entity. Okay. Um, so and what are these screens? So I click on add registration. So this um, you know registration is just screens, and they actually have elements which are not bound to any data, but they sit in a particular screen or a user interface. Now a screen is a loose name. Of course, it could be just a nav bar or the left side bar or anything you want. Um, but it it is a, it is a holder for keeping all these things. Okay. Okay. So now. Um, so I'll save this keyword and uh, we'll close this. Now let's run this. So you see that it is entering all those values and then like continuing and, and you know it's, it's doing all that. And uh, as it does it, it will keep like populating whether it is like working or not working, etc. So it finished, and then you can see that you can also like you know um, view the reports, etc. Like you know there are these reports that are created, so it shows you all the steps that you performed, um, and uh, you can see like what you did there, um, you know, so enter value, etc. So it shows you everything that you did. Um, so we will be refining this further. Um, okay. Now we saw that okay. Um, specifying a simple path and then automating it is 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 fairly easy okay um of course we didn't do like too much of object identification etc so um the next thing we'll do in this is um we'll see how automatic validations work okay so let's do that um so for that we'll use open this uh, particular entity okay and we had just added a couple of um, you know uh, um what do you call it? Error values. Okay. Um. Actually, this is not. This shouldn't be here. This should actually be here. Okay. Um. Let me actually take you first to that particular screen and show you what it looks like. Okay. Um. So I can. Um. So we want to actually go to the screen. So I'll say like you know run till here. So it'll bring me to that particular point. Okay. Um. So this is also an easy way of interacting with the system. You say run till here, and then it will bring you to that point, and then you can proceed further with whatever you want to do there. So, so here we are in the screen. Okay. Now I'm going to just like press continue with, without filling any values, and we see all these error messages and other things that are there, right? So these are the failed validations that are there. If I put a big value, also it will come something similar. So um, let's actually go back to that entity, and. Um, this is the invalid data that we were adding, and this was the error message. So, what is the error message? I can control over on this, and that thing appears here, whatever that error message is, and I'll put it here. And I know that it's the same one for the blank also, so I'm just going to put it there. Okay. So, and update this. Now, we have put in the invalid data, but where will they appear? So, for every UA element, which is a free form uh, element, which is a text box like thing, um, it is possible to actually make mistakes in that. So there would be some validations around it. And like there would be an error element also, which is associated with that. So, um, so what we will do is for this text box input text box first name, we need to associate an error, error element. So what is the error element? This It is the holder of this particular thing. Okay. Um, now, how do we find that? So what we can do is we will control over this. Okay. And um, it shows us this particular div first name, etc., and it says text danger. So we pick one of the alternatives. Um, if we do it for the last name, let's say, okay. So you see that you know it, it says it as um, text danger one. Okay. So this is not great because like you know uh, we don't want to associate it to that index. So what we'll do is we'll control hover on the first name. Okay. And that thing comes here. So I'm going to open this up and these, these three dots, and then click on the anchor button. Okay. And then I hover on 
this particular element again. So it is going to like, you know, give me a relation between these things. So it says it's div takes danger near this label first name. So this is an identifier that I can use, which kind of makes sense in the business, uh, in the business way, as in like, you know, you from the user interface, you can relate to this. So this is my UR error element. Of course, I can actually say, you know, hey, highlight it and show me whether it is the correct one. So it will actually like, you know, um, that it highlighted there, right? So you can play around with that like that. So I'll update this. Okay. Um, so, uh, okay, let's do one thing. Mm. I'll put the UA error element for this uh, similar way, except that this is the last name. Um, I can play around with that here. So, and you know, say whether it, see whether it is um, correct or not. So, I'm highlighting the second one. Um, so, that's that's fine too. So, that is working. Um, so, I'll update this, and I'll put in some similar invalid data here also. So, again, like this is um, blank, um, and the, the okay, the, the error message seems to be this. So, this is the error message, and I'll add another row, and uh, here, like again, I'll give a big value, um, and update this. So um, I could, of course, like, you know, give a comment saying that, you know, hey, this is again greater than 32. So we've just like added a couple of validations here. Okay. And we'll save the keyword and close it. And now we are saying, okay, run validations on this. Okay. So when I say run validations on this, so watch what happens. So the browser comes up, it does registration and then it fills in some value. So it left the first one blank. Okay. And then it said continue. So it found it's it's seeing an error message. Now it is putting in a bigger value. Okay, it says continue. So again, it found the error message. So the first one it became fine. The second one is blank now. So it does that. It found the error. Um, now it went on to actually do that with a bigger value. Again, it found a problem. Now it will go on and try to see whether you know with our valid value everything is working fine after these errors, right? So basically it did all the validations for you. You could have put in a bunch of them. You, you need to, you can add more validations to it and it will automatically go through all that. And, you know, uh, it will give you like, we haven't pulled it back into the report here to say, okay, what are all the field validations and like which ones are, uh, you know, done and not done, but we'll do that. Like you'll pull that back all into this and user interface and show that. So that, that actually, like we just saw that the validations can also be done automatically. Okay. But this is all very simplistic, right? Um, we, we need like something bigger, something like, you know, more meaty. So let's actually look at um, another case. So here um, is something that Sorry, I'm just moving that um, my um, camera screen. Yeah, here we are. Okay. So in this, uh, I was talking about a small example of, you know, a shopping cart wherein you actually, um, you know, check out a product and then uh, you apply a coupon to it. Okay. So um, here is, let's, let's pay attention to this particular path. Okay. So in this part, particular path, this is the checkout path. The first action says that, you know, uh, this is a specific syntax for just login. The reason being that um, in browsers, because of how sessions are handled, you can have only one person logged in at any point of time. So you either log in as a user, log in, not log in as an admin, not log in as an admin, log in as a user, or be not logged in at all. So in this particular case, we don't want the admin to be logged in. Okay. Um, we are not considering a user yet. In fact, like that condition would also come like when, when it is ready. Okay. So we are saying the admin should not be logged in. A product should exist. Then search the product. Add the product to the cart, view the cart, and then what path do we want to take? Do we want to take the path where we add a coupon? No, we are just trying to first say, okay, just nothing, no coupon. What happens? You, you go ahead and verify the total. Okay. Now, next we want to take a path of, okay, I want to add a coupon. Okay. Then what do we do? Then does the coupon exist or doesn't exist? So are you just bluffing in putting in a coupon or like the, does it, does a coupon actually exist? So let us take the bluffing part. Okay. So where like a coupon does not exist, the person applies that coupon to the uh, product. Okay. Verify that the product is uh, the coupon is not applied. Okay. So in this particular case, the coupon should not be applied and then verify the total. So what does the verify total do? So um, verify total basically like says that, you know, okay, if the coupon had a discount, whether the discount is applied in the total or not. Okay. So, um, so let's look at this. 
okay J just just stepping back okay so okay so it will verify the total now let's look at another case where um, the coupon does exist okay and we are applying that coupon to the product okay now there is a case where the this particular coupon was created for this product okay so is the coupon dot product equal to product yeah sure then like apply the apply the coupon and then like uh, the corresponding discount should have been uh, reflecting here okay but what if this coupon was not for this product but some other product okay so then we say that okay hey don't apply that uh, that coupon okay so these kind of like you know take you through a, a brief you know um way of um explaining how the system should behave okay and um, you can easily see like what it is what it is doing here like by by following these paths okay now um so how do you know like whether whether the how do you verify what the car total is so you can actually do this show paths and then you know you can see the data okay so where we say that the product dot price um was 100 and because the coupon is not being applied the subtotal and the total are also 100 okay while actually in this particular case um okay but this this data we specify okay so we specify this data we say that okay um for this particular path okay we say okay the product price enter it as 100 okay um the coupon type we put it as percentage and the discount as 10 and the subtotal will be 100 but the cart total will be 90 this is the behavior that you will see eventually that you know okay uh, when you actually uh, applied that coupon you got a 10 percent discount okay now you would start correlating this hash product and hash coupon etc to entities like we created a user in the previous example in, in the in the flow chart i showed you this actually shows um you know these uh, coupons and, and products etc okay so these are also entities okay now this is the this these are the paths now let's look at um this path it shows that in order to actually do the checkout it needed a product so it went down the path of creating a product okay and then for the product it needed an admin so it created the admin so it actually like you know matched the pre paths and went up to say okay this is the path i need to take this is automatically done by test flow charts okay so how does it match so it says product that exists should be true so it looks for a path where it says product dot exists equal to true this matches so it goes up and here it sees that you know hey the admin should exist so then it like looks for an admin and then like does this okay now for a for a coupon what does it do so let's pick the case of uh, verify uh, this um, coupon so create an admin create a product create a coupon okay so you can click on this so this is the admin object that will be created here is a product of id zero that will be created and then i create a coupon which is for this product zero why is this for the product zero because we have specified here in the coupon that the coupon path looks like this the admin should exist we should be logged in as the admin a product should exist a coupon should not exist at this point we should we should go to the coupon form and there create the coupon for the product and the end uh, you know the the state change after that is that the coupon exists and the coupons product is equal to this product that we have created okay so we have associated this as a coupon dot product equal to product so when we actually do this so it knows that okay i need this product and like the coupon dot product is is this product okay so it, it creates that um you know uh, relation and then it will it will go ahead and do all the steps that are needed now of course all these are like you know implemented similar to what i showed you with the with the account uh, you know user account registration now let's look at this this interesting thing where the coupon dot product is not equal to product okay so let's like actually pick this path okay so here um no, we want this path okay so we want to come here so look at what this is doing so it says create the admin okay create a product which is product zero then create a coupon which is which is for this product it's coupon zero and product zero then create another product so it goes on to actually figure out hey you know what i want a product which is which has um which doesn't which is not associated with coupon this coupon so it actually creates another product okay product one okay then it does a checkout and in this checkout it is applying for product one coupon zero and because of this it will not apply because this coupon zero belongs to product zero so it knows how to do that okay and then actually it, it satisfy all these conditions right. and then it will execute it yeah not in time check five minutes yeah, sure. yeah thank you very much um so that that is what it does and of course like once you have these things in place you can actually do run all okay and it will execute all these scripts together like in parallel so like if you you will um so if i were to like you know and do this so you can see that you know multiple browsers will open up they'll all execute in parallel and then you know um 
and uh, give you the reports at the end. Okay. Now going back to the uh, presentation. So what are the problems and solutions that we actually like, you know, uh, saw and fixed in this, right? So the main problem was visibility and repetition. The visibility, basically we are bringing out the actual, uh, you know, we're keeping it, um, we, there's no code in this, of course, the end user doesn't do that. They specify things like, you know, in, in designated places, the flowchart actually lets you navigate in, you know, um, understand what, um, what the flow is and navigate still that by, you know, uh, matching all the pre parts, et cetera. Right. So it is it, the, the overall user interface is like, you know, you can, you can see the business, um, business test case in that. Okay. And then we solve the problem of repetition because we added, you know, these data generators, etc. It can automatically, you know, run, of course, like, you know, in some cases, this may not always work. We may need to actually pick from specific values, etc. but that is, it is, it is possible to do that in that. Okay. Test creation is auto-generated. So there is no effort in that. Data generation, you know, we give uh, inbuilt data generators and we also like, we saw that, uh, you know, discount and total subtotal, right? So we overwrote that data at the path level. So you, uh, you know, it'll, uh, when we give an override like that, it'll use that data instead of the uh, data generators thing. Then object maintenance, there was an inbuilt object repository and you know, uh, we also had the uh, uh, recorder and like objects by etc with which we could do that um keyword implementation was with the recorder so there was no effort involved in that um parameter passing is automatic script generation is automatic reporting is automatic so you basically like do very less in this and you get a lot of effort right um so uh, this is more on the flowcharts basically like what i said like you know uh, it depicts application functionality pre like express preconditions etc etc right so uh, what we saw in that um i'll leave this um so beyond the demo, right? Like there are, what if like you want to use, uh, there are multiple users in this. So you want to add a user one as a beneficiary to user two. So the concept of like hash user one, hash user two also exists where it is, it'll take the entity and like create multiple instances of it. There is a concept of, you know, um, numerical conditions where you say like, if login attempts is less than three, okay. If it is more than three, like lock the scene, lock the screen, etc. Um, there are complex path matching. It'll actually like, you know, traverse across paths and the paths themselves need not be in a single flow chart. They can be across multiple flow charts. It in a project, it will automatically look for all of them. And of course, like reporting, uh, we haven't built that all uh, fully yet. So it'll, it is coming soon. So thank you very much. That was that was our uh, presentation. Um, I hope you liked it. This is more information about it. Testflowchart.com has a free, free uh, you know, um, uh, version also. So you can just like uh, log in and start using it. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Uh, thank you, Narayan, for sharing your experience with us. Thank you very much, Thanks.